Many political experts say that the recently unveiled budget was more of an election budget offering support to a number of areas, including health care and education. The government is projecting a $2.4 billion surplus here in Alberta and spending around $67 billion. Now, to chat about this in more detail is our legislative reporter and the Alberta correspondent with the National Post, Tyler Dawson, who joins us once again from Edmonton. Tyler, the Smith government says this puts Alberta on firm fiscal footing and will help guide us into the future. But let me ask you something. What happens if the price of oil tanks again? Well, you know, that's sort of the question that gets asked every single year. You know, we, we really think about that during the sort of downturn years um, and haven't thought about it all that much, maybe in the last little bit. Um, there's no doubt that this is a pretty big spending budget. As you said, I think $67 billion, which is actually higher than if the New Democrats had stayed in government in 2019. Their projected spending for this year was actually lower than that. So, it, so it's it's a big spending budget. There's, there's no doubt about that at all. Um, and, and there isn't really all that much consideration of what might happen if royalty revenues drop off. You know, the other thing that comes up every year is, is there going to be a PST? Is there going to be a PST? Of course, there isn't. Um, certainly not this year. Um, so, you know, it is an interesting budget in that regard, but it really makes, I think, the most sense if you look at it in, in terms of there's an election in, you know, what is it, 10 or 12 weeks or something like that. And uh, this government needs to show that they're going to be sort of spending money where people want it to be spent. Um, there's no doubt that that's an angle here. Yeah, healthcare and education, two of the top priorities for a lot of people, a lot of Albertans right now, and the government recognized that. Tyler, some funding from the province is actually making its way here to southern Alberta. The UCP says there's, what, $503 million for 70 projects and another $211 million for municipal wastewater expenses. That's right. You know, so this is not necessarily the world's most exciting spending. Um, you know, twinning highways and stuff like that is very useful, but uh, I don't know how many people are getting super worked up about it. But but this is sort of specific funding for southern Alberta, the Lethbridge general area. Um, a couple of uh, members of the legislature were actually in Lethbridge earlier this week to talk about all that. So uh, as you say, you know, a number of infrastructure projects, about 70 is what they're expecting, I think. Um, you know, this would be things like roundabouts and highway twinning and, um, you know, that sort of stuff. And then, of course, the money for municipal wastewater services as well. So, you know, the sort of key infrastructure funding, I would say, for, for southern Alberta. Um, and I think we can probably expect to see some targeted funding for these sorts of things around the province in the next little bit. Um, you know, just sprinkle that money around a little bit. Yeah. Well, there's something that we're really concerned about as well as safety when it comes to the, the twinning of the highways when they're not twinned, you know, a lot of accidents and as well opening up the agricultural community that much more, especially with the Highway 3 twinning, which is taking place here. Now, Tyler, the budget also included a new rule, which says the province must stick to balanced budgets unless there's an emergency. So let me ask you, what would constitute an emergency? Well, isn't that the question, right? You know, is a major collapse in oil prices an emergency? Is another pandemic an emergency or a major national natural disaster? Um, you know, it's a good question. Um, and, and, you know, there have been balanced budget sort of laws in other places in the past, and they can get ignored here and there. But, you know, this is an attempt, I suppose, by the, the government to show that it is sort of committed to this sort of fiscal um, responsibility framework and an attempt, I guess, to compel any future governments to to stick to that. Now, there is a little bit of an out baked into this, and that's inflation plus population growth. So, you know, in a high inflation year, of course, spending can go up by the the, the uh, inflation rate. So, you know, there's there's certainly room in here for governments to spend more each year, um, it, you know, I guess unless we go into a major period of deflation. But uh, if, if that happens, I think we'd probably have um, a few other problems. Now, the province has introduced Bill 8, and it's all about guns. Can you explain? Yeah, so Alberta has a chief firearms officer now, and this legislation sort of sets out the, the rules and stuff like that around that position. And, you know, the, the notable thing about it, because, I mean, that stuff's sort of bureaucratically important, but maybe not all that politically exciting. The, the politically exciting thing is it also purports to give the justice minister right um the power i guess to to uh say how gun federal gun regulations are going to be enforced in alberta and so obviously the big one here at the moment is the federal liberals bill c21 which you know was backtracked on a little bit because it 
turned out to be banning a bunch of hunting rifles. But the concern is that there's going to be a gun buyback at some point. And so basically the key part of this legislation is going to be what power Justice Minister Tyler Shandro has to um, prevent local law enforcement, for example, from participating in something like a gun buyback. Um, so that might require, say, getting a license from the province to participate in such a thing, which and then the province, of course, wouldn't give a license. Um, so, you know, it, it sort of builds out the uh, bureaucratic infrastructure, legal infrastructure a bit around the firearms officer. Um, but the, I think the political thing to watch is going to be what happens if a gun buyback program comes here and then what power does Chandro try to exercise in that situation? So Tyler, do you think maybe the province would actually bring forth the Alberta Sovereignty Act to maybe veto some of that federal legislation? Well, the thing is they could, um, or at least they, you know, the thing about it is that using the Sovereignty Act, I don't think would do anything much different than what they're planning to do here, right? Like if, if they're creating this legal framework where the government is saying, sorry, no, Alberta people can't participate in administering this program, is that any different than what the Sovereignty Act um, purports to do, right? So, you know, I think this is the sort of situation that had been talked about as a Sovereignty Act option, but um, there also seems to be this other way they can go about doing this and creating different legislation. So it, it's a bit of a, you have to sort of wonder if they're doubling up on this a little bit or if they yeah. are looking for other avenues to sort of do Sovereignty Act Sovereignty Act style things without actually invoking the act. Now, one of the stories we featured on Bridge City News earlier this week was how Grand Prairie is moving towards its own municipal police force and no longer using the RCMP. Now, the transition will take around five years and cost millions of dollars. That's right. So it should be sort of 2027-ish by the time the force is sort of fully transitioned. You know, there, there's tons of logistics that go into something like this, you know, from buying police cars to body armor and pepper spray and hiring officers and you, you need an HR department. Like there's all sorts of stuff that needs to go into this sort of transition. But, you know, from a political perspective, I think the interesting thing is that the budget set out about $10 million to help Grand Prairie with this transition. Um and when you look at, you know, obviously we've talked before about the possibility of having an Alberta Provincial Police Service and what that might look like, what that might cost, those sorts of things. And Danielle Smith has said she's in favor of that. But it, it does appear to be on the back burner a little bit right now. You know, there hasn't been much development on that front in the last few months. I don't know if they're waiting until after the election. Um, but the other thing to consider is whether or not you know, there are some places that might just do this on their own, and that'll be sort of a way in to larger reform of the RCMP. Of course, there's not that many large municipalities left to get their own police service. You know, I think Red Deer maybe still has the RCMP, Fort McMurray. Um, those might be the only two big ones off the top of my head. So anyways, it, it, it's really interesting, I think, in the context of the spending set aside to assist it, this political goal that has been a part of the UCP program for a couple of years of, of replacing the RCMP. Um, and, and you know, in the, in the much broader context, of course, other municipalities have done this as well, Surrey being one in BC in the last couple of years. So it, 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 it's actually, you know, it's, it's a bit of a microcosm, I think, of some of the much larger issues happening with the RCMP and policing in general. And you know what, I think this is the first time since 1956 that a municipality has uh, gone away from the RCMP and brought in their own municipal police force. I was just going to jump in and say, and I have no idea which police force that was in 1956. I mean, it was probably Lethbridge or Madison Hat, um, but I have no idea. And <laughs> I'm curious about that, actually. You know, it's kind of cool in the archives here at the Galt Museum in Lethbridge. We looked at some of the Alberta pro Provincial Police Force that we had a long time ago, and they're actually machine guns on motorbikes with the guys in the sidecar. I'm like, wow, that was hardcore, this Alberta Provincial Police Force back way back when. Tyler, the election, as we talked about, is coming up at the end of May. Now, a recent poll says the UCP and the NTP are essentially tied, but there are 22% who are undecided. So I guess both parties have to really work hard to shore up support over the next 10 to 12 weeks or so. Yeah, really interesting situation. So you've got about 35% supporting both. Um, and the NDP have a lead in Edmonton. The UCP have a lead in Calgary. The UCP has, or no, sorry, they're tied in Calgary. They're, they're sort of neck and neck in Calgary across the whole province. NDP is up in Edmonton and the UCP are very much up in rural Alberta. Now that 22% undecided seems to have come in significant portion 
from people who voted UCP in 2019 and are now unsure who they're going to vote for. So that's a really, really interesting situation because you have this group of people who, you know, were maybe the UCP voters in 2015 and the Justin Trudeau voters in 2015 kind of thing. Um, so you have to wonder where those people are going to go. And you have to wonder what the parties are going to try and do to attract these voters. Um, you know, for Danielle Smith, for example, that puts her in an interesting position because she has a party base that she needs to keep happy. Um, but she also needs to attract these sort of suburban Calgary voters, these suburban Lethbridge voters, these suburban Edmonton voters um, in, in a way that is going to be maybe a little bit of a challenge to do when put up against some of the priorities of the party faithful in places like Grand Prairie, for example. So it's a really, really interesting political dynamic. And um, you have to wonder what each party is looking at and thinking, oh, my goodness, how do I how do I swing these people? But you would think maybe that the governing party would have the advantage because they would spend more taxpayers' dollars to potentially buy some votes. I mean, we've seen that time and time again leading up to an election. More capital projects, you know, down the road. And, and we'll, get, we'll get to it after the election, not before the election, right? Now, Tyler, Alberta, along with the federal government, is banning the use of TikTok on government devices. It appears as though many government officials have security and privacy concerns. Right. So TikTok, of course, is owned by a Chinese company. And there's been concern for, for a few years now that there might be you know, some data harvesting, spying concerns, things like that. And so what the, the federal government did is basically saying, you know, look, you can't have this on a, a federal government company phone. And Alberta government followed suit and Calgary did, too. Now, Edmonton is still looking at it. Um, and of course, people are still going to use these things on their personal phones. Social media is such a big part of government and, and political campaigning these days. But, uh, you know, just notable that, that this uh, security concern has popped up, not just in the federal government, but in provincial and municipal government as well. Now, the legislature is back. What are some of the hot button topics that are being discussed? Maybe EMS, wait times and hospital construction? What are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, the, the the spiciest one at the moment seems to be this sort of leaked memo that suggests that paramedics only have, I think, 45 minutes sort of transit time in hospital, you know, so the concern, of course, is that they might be dumping people in hospital and not having anyone to receive them in hospital. Um, so, so, and the UCP says, no, no, that's a target, that's not a mandate, so on and so forth. But, you know, it, it has uh, been sort of as fiery, I think, as you'd expect on some of the, some of the issues that we've been talking about a lot, like EMS dispatch, for example. So, um, I, <laughs> I don't think it's going to get any friendlier in the next you know, however many weeks, um, as, as both parties are sort of testing out what their arguments and their talking points are going to be and getting the base riled up and creating ads and attacking one another, you know, so I think it's, it's going to get, uh, it'll get worse before it gets better, shall we say. Tyler, let me ask you something. If you, if the UCP ends up winning this next election, let's say it's a majority, do you potentially see that maybe Rachel Notley would step aside as leader? Maybe somebody like Shannon Phillips, our Lethbridge West MLA would pursue the leadership? You know, I think it's a possibility. Um, it, it has been tough to say the last couple of years, I think, who sort of the heir apparent might be for Rachel Notley. You know, she's just had a grip on that party for so long. You know, it's, it's almost hard to imagine the party without her, you know. Um, but I, I think it's a possibility. You know, it, it's tough to lead a party through two losses after being the government in power. Um, so I think it's a possibility. H have I heard much about the potential for it? No, I haven't. But you can certainly see that happening. And, you know, of course, the question is sort of the same. If Danielle Smith loses for the UCP, I believe that mandates leadership review um, under party rules. So you have to wonder what happens to her. Do you think as the dust really settled, are the, is the UCP really united once again within party ranks? What have you seen? I think more united than we have seen in recent years. And the, and the reason I say that is because, you know, we just talked about the polling and there's a real pressing need for these guys to all get along if they want to keep their jobs. Um, you know, for the first sort of couple of years of the government and then into the pandemic, you know, there was, they were in government. They, an election seemed a long ways away. They could, they could have this sort of infighting and public fighting. And, you know, that, obviously affected their electoral fortunes at the time. You know, pollsters always ask if the election was held today, who would you vote for? But of course, the election was never going to be held today. Um, it was in the future. But but now the election is like right there. And um, I think there has been, I think, first of all, a lot of people are happier now that Jason Kenney's gone. And so there, that's brought some harmony 
But there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that a huge portion of why everyone is getting along, seemingly at least, is that uh, they don't want to lose. It should be an interesting 10 weeks or so. He's our legislative reporter and the Alberta correspondent for the National Post, Tyler Dawson. Thanks so much for joining us today from Edmonton. Always a pleasure, Hal.